Welcome back, mindful investors. In this coming set of videos, we'll do a Q&A podcast style with my friend Alesh. Everything in these videos will be unscripted and much more natural. The topics that we'll cover are the fire movement, our biggest successes and mistakes, stocks, bonds, and many other financial topics. Please let me know if you find any value in these videos. I mean, that's the type of videos I would want to watch because it's real and it's people's unique experience. I believe the second best way to learn is from our own experience, but the first way are from others' experience because we can save so much time and pick and choose from people's case studies. Let's say if everyone out there has 10 positive attributes and you can pick and choose the attributes you want to replicate to carve out your own financial success. Isn't that so much better than just replicating a textbook, let's say the intelligent investor or Warren Buffett, because everyone is unique. Let's get to the video, shall we? Shoo. Hello everybody, uh, my name is uh, Alesh Eisner and uh, this is my friend uh, Rob. It is absolutely amazing to hear that you are financially independent at your age. Can you summarize how you got to this point in your life? So uh, hello everyone, I'm Rob. It says that I'm financially independent at my age, which is 37 right now. And I don't really recall when I got to this uh, status, I guess. But how I got here is from my first engineering job back, I think, 10 years, more than 10 years ago. That gave me a solid salary, I think about starting at like 55K and then built it up to 75. But what this kind of gave me is the, the ability to get a mortgage. Like that is the leverage I needed to get um, kind of ahead, you call it. So from my mortgage and real estate, over time, it definitely made more than the salary itself. And during this corporate job, I did uh, a lot of side jobs. We have a night market here in Vancouver and I run like different stands. And as some of you may know, we deal with a lot of cash. And <laughs> with this cash, th this is where my, uh, my down payment came. So I used all this cash to funnel into down payments to real estate projects. And then I use my corporate job to finance it and get more money from the banks. And that's kind of how I got the ball rolling. But then as time went on in my night market job, I, I find that on some weekends, I made more money in one weekend than one month in my engineering job, which is like mind blowing in, in my opinion, because I spent like four, four years to get that bachelor's degree and all this time I could have made more money. In this one weekend, I can make more than a month of salary. Just think about that. You want to be able to see this light. I think like shortly after I left my job and just went full force. And then that's when I went to China and Hong Kong and did, I did some business there. I funneled my cash flows there to investing into real estate there as well and stocks. In Hong Kong, the, the market is very different, the stock market, I mean. People leverage a lot. People like, there's no one just buying plain stocks and sitting and holding. People like leverage in and out like 5X, 10X all the time. There's like just a lot of home run players out there. And I, I picked up a few tricks, I guess, and I got lucky a couple of times. Here we are, I guess. So that's my story of being financially independent. So I remember the, uh... Uh, the Chinese stock market in general, there there was a lot of ups, but there were also some downs. You you got uh, caught in any of those or managed to avoid them? Yeah, for sure. Every, everyone learns from their mistakes. And what I learned is the skill of risk management, where when you lose, you kind of don't, you try not to, to lose your shirt, we call it. But when you win, you want to be able to leverage and really kill it. If we just stayed in neutral and just sat on it, I could have been up and down and up and down and I could have been like broke, broke even at the end. But with these, all the leverage plays, 
let's say if you make a 500% gain and then you only lose 100% in the next play, overall you're still up. So you still have a chip and a chair, we call it. So you can keep playing. So uh, into these, I would say, fairly risky investments, what percentage of your portfolio did you put in at any point? Well, I had real estate sitting more than 50%. So my play money, and I always had cash on the sidelines, I'd say 25% cash on the sidelines and maybe just 25% just these speculative plays, we call it. All right. So I didn't manage my risk that way. So not a tiny bit, but not your whole savings no. either. Okay, cool. And so it turns out the business uh, world was way better to you than the actual work world. <laughs> uh, for, for me, yes. For me, yes. Yeah. I, I mean, a lot of people would be happy with the corporate engineering job and sitting there for 30 years. But I found out really, really early on, like my third weekend, I look around and I just didn't want to be there. I like the, I like the status. I like the college shirt. I like walking in downtown, but not much after that. Yeah. Yeah, I, I think it's uh, depending on whether you're entrepreneurial or whether you're risk averse. And, and some people don't want to take the risk of starting a business. And so they'll work for somebody else for years. And then they have a secure job, but they're not going to, uh, you know, to, to make it big anytime. For sure. There, there is no right way to live your life. I, I say, yeah. Yeah. I, I think it's a person's personality that sort of drives what they can and cannot do. And so by virtue of, of you being able to take those risks, you were able to make a better life for yourself. Yeah. So let's hear about your story, Alesh. Yeah, well, it uh, it all started on a cloudy day in 1973. Uh, kidding. Uh, so, but the, the date is right. I, I am 47. So, uh, Rob, your your financial independence is is more impressive than mine. Uh, but uh, yeah, my my family came here in in the 80s as immigrants with virtually nothing. So I I was raised here. I, I went to Simon Fraser University, but I lived at home and I had a scholarship, so I emerged uh, free of debt, of student uh, loans or anything like that, so that was nice. In fact, I worked a couple of co-op jobs, so I had about 20K uh, saved up. With my first job, there was a financial advisor who came into the office, and I'm like, I, I've got money, let's, let's invest it. And I think that's how I got started on the investing road. My road is is more, uh, if you remember Kiyosaki Squadrangle, I'm kind of the investment version. I'm, I'm not really so much the business version. I lived at home as uh, long as uh, as I could, uh, <laughs> which, which also saved, uh, saved a couple of bucks. And uh, I, uh, I bought a, a house uh, also in Surrey where I'm still living and uh, I worked extra contracts in, in the evenings uh, to make extra money in, in addition to uh, an IT job, which uh, I've always worked in IT. Then at one point I became uh, a contractor about 10 years ago, I, I was incorporated. Uh, that also coincided with my relationship ending. So uh, despite a prenuptial agreement, there was a significant monetary loss when my ex and I went our separate ways. Um, and I'm, I'm always happy that it was early. I'm not happy that it ended, but I'm happy that it ended early. And uh, at that point, I started uh, investing in a serious way. Uh, there was a a job that, uh, that kind of made me think that I would I would need to, to reach financial independence early. And so uh, I started taking some risks. Uh, after the US had their US uh, housing crash, I started buying investment properties there, uh, which people would find risky, but uh, I was just like, well, this house was 300,000 six months ago. Now it's uh, owned by a bank and it's 88,000. People are gonna have to live somewhere I don't really see the problem. So uh, started buying individual stocks as well. Uh, up until then, I was mostly a mutual fund 
uh, guide, but started buying individual stocks so I could pick the ones that pay dividends because for financial independence, you need uh, uh, passive income. Continued with my frugality. Uh, to this date, I've never owned a car. I've had access to one in previous times, but uh, I, I haven't owned a car ever. And uh, so just the accumulation for the, the last 10 years, I've, I've made good money, but also I, I invested most of it and that money has grown and it, it has paid the, the dividends over the years as well. So I, in, in the last 10 years, I actually looked at the numbers and my net worth went up let's say roughly uh, 2 million, give or take, maybe a little bit more. Uh, I'm at 3.7 now. And my, uh, my job provided only about half of that. The other half was from various investments, growth, uh, business ventures, such as uh, flips in real estate as well. So that's really what makes the difference. If you take a bit of a risk, you can uh, over the long term anyway you can achieve your goals okay you mentioned uh you went in to buy some real estate back around 2008 2000, 2009 yeah i started buying pretty much one a year starting like 2009 and then i bought another one in, in 2010 2011 2012 they've been uh, definitely uh, good investments as far as money, but they're definitely not the passive uh, investment that uh, real estate is supposed to be. They're, they're property managed by property managers, but then you have to manage the managers as well. So yeah, they, they've, been, they've been challenging. And these deals, were they like cash deals? Because I never bought US properties. I find Sometimes it may be hard, it might be harder to get the mortgage from them. Yeah, so at that point, uh, because what caused the real estate crash was uh, the financial crisis. And so it, it was pretty much impossible as a foreigner to get uh, a loan in the US. So I ended up buying all the properties for cash, which wasn't that much because like I said, 88,000, I think was the first one, 95 was the second one, uh, 110 and then 140 for, for the four of them. So it wasn't that much money, frankly, uh, but I did end up uh, getting a, a mortgage on the house that I was living in, in Canada, in Surrey, in order to finance them. But of course the house was worth more than than all those properties back then together so it wasn't that difficult to finance it so yeah. uh the the one problem is is that real estate depends a lot on leverage and because there's no leverage here the returns are basically three percent to three percent a year if it was leveraged then on the money invested the it would be much higher percentage return and so that's what makes them sort of difficult as far as investments is because they're not really gaining that much in, in value anymore. And as far as cash flow, uh, uh, it's not great. So, but, but I think you the play there was you, you're hoping to get capital gains on the property more than getting a 3% dividend. Uh, so that, that's right. Yeah. Uh, that's right. And I mean, over over the years, they, they've definitely gone up in price, double, tripled some of them. Uh, I had sold one of them. I have three left. Uh, I sold one this past summer. Uh, I think that was the, the 88,000 one and I sold it for 276. It's definitely done well. Uh, yeah. Obviously going to pay the capital gain stax on it. So that's going to take a little, little chunk out of it. But uh, yeah, I can't complain about that. But the, the number one rule with real estate is that it has to cash flow. Now it, it is cash flowing, uh, two to three percent. But if it actually had a mortgage, which is usually assumed to, the, that you do have a mortgage, uh, and, and then you still have to make it cash flow. So if I had a reasonable interest rate mortgage, it would barely be cash flowing. And uh, it's not an investment if you can't make it cash flow.
anybody can make a paid off property cash flow. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so yeah, if, if you can't do that, then you shouldn't be investing in real estate. <laughs> yeah, you're in the wrong gig for sure. You're you're in the wrong gig. So uh, yeah, <laughs> it's uh, so yeah. I, I do want to harvest the the capital gains at this point, and my plan, or at least that's what I'm telling my accountant, is that I'm going to sell one a year, uh, and and we'll see where it goes. Uh, I definitely want to sell one next year. I might keep the next two. Uh, they're both in Las Vegas, um, and they're under the same property manager, which seems to be decent. I, I did have to fire one property manager because they were uh, incompetent, they weren't helpful, and there were extra charges by mistake on my statements. And if I didn't call them on it, they would have just sent me less rent. Uh, so I, I didn't appreciate that. I doubt they were all accidents. Anyways. Yeah. So, so I, I think it's, it's, it's very courageous to buy <laughs> real estate in the States. Uh, like I, I never got through that barrier of buying remote, especially in the States and how you manage them. How did you choose the location? Is there like a mindset behind it? It's like, like the places that fell the most you went for it, the places that it's like, close proximity to where you are or is it like you have your relatives there or <laughs> <laughs> no, well no no relatives uh i think i sort of accidentally fell into it uh to be honest uh i started out in in phoenix first uh because that one fell first and fell the most uh i googled a uh, a realtor <laughs> there yeah that's total, total total accident he happened to be a Canadian who was living down there. So he was catering to Canadians. So he was very helpful. Um, and I have to confess, I've never seen any of the properties physically. Never. Um, uh, that's, that's, that's a hard one for me. <laughs> you do hear stories. Maybe my stories are different where in China, you, they can like promise you, they can go in and shoot a video for you of what you're buying. But ultimately, just buying a little box in the sidewalk. You need to have a lot of a certain amount of trust in the system. And I guess the U.S. has a much higher standard than what we have in China. So what, what was your experience in China? Uh, you, you hear things when people buy things remote because they know you're remote. So you're very less likely to check on them within like five years time. And realtors there can really like, we call it scam you or like forge documents. There's, there's like nothing out of the ordinary is, is what they do. And it's, it's hard to build trust. Even if you go there, they can show you a unit. They can show you around. They can even have a rep on the other side saying, oh, the, the owner is, is really letting this go because they need money to do business and such. The whole story makes sense, but ultimately, what you're buying is just a piece of paper. So outright, outright fraud? Yes. Okay. <laughs> I, yeah, I mean, I, I was, so I assume the, the one, you have just the one, you have the one property? Well, I, I didn't buy it, but I, I have stories of friends. Who oh, I see. Okay. Many. But did you go see the one that you did buy? Uh, yes, of course. Okay. And actually, I lived in it for like a couple months. And then I found my first tenant and I just passed it on. Right now. Oh, okay. Well, that, that's, yeah. Make that's, sure the uh, unit is mine. <laughs> that, that the owners didn't show up from a holiday. Exactly. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I, so I didn't go see them for, for a couple of reasons. Number one, I'm not a good flyer. Uh, number two, I would have to take a bunch of time off of work, which would have cost me a, a bunch of money. And I was wondering what, uh, value I would add. Uh, you know, I'm I'm not going to spend a week there uh, it, living in the neighborhood. And even after a week, you probably don't get to know the neighborhood. Like I, I know living in Surrey for my whole life, I know where to go at night, where not to go at night. You know, <laughs> you know what I mean? You won't know that in, in a city where you, you're for a couple of days. Uh, I wasn't going to climb into the attic. So I had them uh, professionally inspected uh, by somebody who wasn't recommended by the realtor. 
because oh. the, re the realtor wants to make a sale, right? And and they they want you to to to, to buy it and and not to be difficult and not to move on to another house. You know, you know the realtor. I I googled him uh, as far as whether there were any complaints about him. There there weren't. Uh, <laughs> so I mean that was it. Had him take a bunch of pictures. Did everything on on the maps. The, that I could, and it, it, you know, knock on wood, they're all mine. Everything, everything yeah. worked out. Uh, got the property managers uh, again by googling. Got a different one for each property, which ended up being a bit of a, uh, maybe a bit of a mistake. Uh, but then one I fired and transferred the the house to to a, a property manager that I already had the house with. The biggest hassles, frankly, are uh, the, the US to Canadian currency transfers because you don't want to keep transferring back and forth. So it, it, you, you have to predict expenses, like you know, there's going to be property taxes, so I need to save up Can uh, US dollars so I, I don't transfer whatever's coming in to Canadian and then transfer it back because you lose, you lose money on each transaction. Uh, having to do U.S. taxes is uh, is a huge hassle. Oh yeah, it's a huge uh, hassle there. And you have to pay a, an accountant uh, a hefty amount to do uh, U.S. taxes. I think the property managers, if they see a foreign address, they are going to take advantage of you of because I think they would be less happy having somebody show up at their office yelling and screaming than somebody who can only do it on the phone. Yeah. Uh, so. Uh, how how have your property management experience has been? Well, the the things I have here locally, I I manage myself. I like to check on the tenants and kind of build a relationship there. It's just having another friend. But the thing <laughs> <laughs> okay, <laughs> so to me, it's that way. Like if they can actually be like, tr like a true friend, they can be a great tenant. Like, like that's my that's okay. my but is, is your good friend frequently late with the rent and you let him go yeah they're they're always on time they okay. tell me if they're late ahead of time and like building this relationship i think is like is a key to like managing your tenants if you're like so strict is like every first of the month you just 9 a.m you text them where's my rent and then they kind of have that rebel side is like oh uh, i'll just respond to them two weeks later or whatever but if you just just take it easy and just make a friend okay well good that's that's one approach usually professional managers take a very professional approach yeah. and they they try to get uh, access to to the tenant's account so they can pull the money out of their bank account or out of their credit card or whatever it is uh, and they want to do it electronically. They don't want to go collect a check or, or anything like that. And, and no, no, everything is electronic. And okay. I got to like, like uh, do a prepayment thing. So every first of the month or whatever, it's just a prepayment. There's no action between either of us. So. Yeah, yeah. Just automate as much as you can, right? Yeah. Yes. And then only act if if the payment didn't go through. Then you're like, okay, your 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 account's overdrawn. What's going on? Yeah. Yeah, but the the things in China again, there's there's no no really a trust factor there. You, I've had cases where they say, "Oh, the market's down. There's no one who wants to rent your place." Was just being vacant for like three months. I was there like at that time, and I went in to check, and when they just used it as a as a party room, <laughs> they oh, kind wow. of sublet it as an Airbnb or use use it as a party room. The unit did appreciate in value, but my rental income is definitely nothing. Like pretty much sometimes you just want to neglect the rental income even and just like watch the thing appreciate, which is not the way to real to invest in real estate. Yeah, I mean the the books that I've read, they they want the real estate to appreciate four percent and they want you to cash flow four percent. If you're getting kind of high single digit returns, you're probably doing okay. In, yeah. in Vancouver, real estate has appreciated a whole bunch. Uh, in the U.S., uh, obviously, over the years, it, it has as well. Uh, I mean, each place is different. For me, I, I'm going to transition into, into other asset types, which 
which will require quite the same households as as the real estate does. Uh, yeah. So so stocks will appreciate just as well. They they obviously could go down, but uh, and, and they'll pay dividends, which are number one more tax friendly. If I buy Canadian stocks, uh, they'll, they'll be a higher rate. So five six percent dividends are not uncommon in Canada. So so that's kind of what I'm. Uh, what I'm going to go over the next few years into, as I said, I'll start selling the properties. The the first property I sold to pay off the the loan that I got in March in order to to buy a whole bunch of stocks in March 2020 when when they crashed. So uh, I didn't really get get that much uh, out of that house other than paying off the the HELOC. So that wraps it up for the first topic. So what do you think about this format? Let me know. Are there certain aspects that you want us to elaborate on? Again, thanks for watching. Drop a like and subscribe if you found any value in the video. Take care and I'll see you in the next one.